Welcome back to a new episode of The Sweetest Deal. Uh, this time I'm going to talk to Olivier Busquet, a guy I talked a lot to during my years on the tour 2005 to 2016. Uh, Olivier was for a while maybe the best heads up uh, sit and go turbo player in the world where he uh, uh, made his uh, first money in poker. Uh, then he had a specific really great few years uh, doing great in live tournaments continued to play live as well. Uh, now he lives in New Jersey and uh, we had a really nice talk for uh, well over an hour actually talking about life then, uh, what happened since and uh, what he's doing today. So uh, I'm looking forward to this talk immensely. Uh, this uh, show is as always uh, done together with our partners Every Game Poker. So uh, enjoy our chat with uh, Olivia Busquet. So in this new episode of The Sweetest Deal, I talk to a guy I have talked to quite a lot uh, throughout the years when I was active in poker, Olivia Busquier. How are you, Olivia? I'm doing great. God, how are you? Yeah, very good. Where, where are you now? Um, I moved about a year ago to a house in South Jersey, central South Jersey. So I was living in North Jersey in a small town called Edgewater right by the, the, the bridge uh, to Manhattan, and uh, I... Met a woman, fell in love, bought a house, and moved to South Jersey, um, much closer to Philadelphia, actually. Um, so I've been there for about a year now. Is, is that why you were brought up from the beginning, or is that is those no? Are I, the hoods? I was born and raised in Manhattan, in New York City, um, and then I moved to Jersey to play in New Jersey poker, online regulated poker, and then yeah, so slowly outside of Manhattan, and then now fully in the suburbs, living the more kind of traditional American family life. Yeah, it looks like you're you're in good health. Are you happy with life as it is right now? Yeah, life is probably as good as it's ever been. I I got engaged yesterday, actually. Wow. So, yeah. So, um, and then yeah, poker's going well. Physically, I feel good. No, life is life is 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 doing great. Excellent. No, I I started in poker in two thousand five and followed the the poker circuit really close for about 11 years until 2016. When, when mm -hmm. was your first steps into uh, online poker to begin with? Yeah, not, not that different from you. Uh, probably 2000, late 2003, um, 2004. Yeah, I think it's been about 18 years, so, 18 which is years. a long time. Yeah, that's uh, a long and time. I, started, I started playing online. Um, that's how I learned, and, and that's always been the majority of my of the poker hands I've played have been online, so. Yeah, I think yeah. there were a few years for both of us before we got into the business, uh, you as a player and I as a journalist, that, that the poker boom kind of were brewing and it was starting up there. Was it, would, you, would you give some credit to, for example, Chris Moneymaker for, for your yeah. interest in it? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say that I have this kind of direct Chris Moneymaker effect. Like some people will say they literally saw Chris Moneymaker win and that inspired them. Um, I think, I was a little bit later than that, but you know the the boom from from the Chris Moneymaker effect was in full force, and um, I was actually learning poker for a slightly different reason. I was working on Wall Street, I was working at a at a hedge fund, and I wanted to basically learn skills that I was told and thought would be relevant for trading uh, poker and and trading are thought to have some skill set overlap, and so I was learning poker as a way to say, hey, look, I can develop these skills and I can be good at this. There's not a lot of direct ways to to learn trading uh, unless you're actually doing it. Um, there's no like books or like real training programs. Um, at least there weren't at the time. Mm. So that's how I first got into poker. Um, and then, yeah, it was so popular at the time in, in part due to Moneymaker. And I think also just, you know, it was, it was so big and so new. I mean, poker has been around for a long time, but this, this online poker and, and people still, I think hadn't figured out how to play that well. Um, so it was just much, much easier for someone like me who was inexperienced and not very good, obviously, to, to, to have some success and to have developed some confidence. And, and, and I think that's important to, at least for me to motivate, you know, to keep working and learning and trying. And I think if I had, if me at that time was trying to enter the poker world now, I, I don't think I would have succeeded. Honestly, I don't think I would have. I don't think I would have liked it as much. I don't think it would. The opportunity just wasn't the same. I mean, obviously, the learning opportunity. You know, you can you can learn and get better much faster now, but still, it was just it was the wild west back then. It was there was so much to learn and um, and so much edge that you could have. 
um, that it was it was just a special special time. So I was very lucky in that sense. Yeah, I think uh, quite a few pl- players have said that that it was thanks to the timing and the, the the mix of all the players, and there were so many players that did it for fun. It was kind of a new thing as well, so it was kind of easy, much easier as well to to, oh, to yeah. be successful. Uh, you talked about Wall Street and 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 working at hedge funds. What, was that like your your way, your your professional life? Because uh, were you good at that? I was too young to even know. Um, you know, I was just a couple of years out of college. They didn't give me important or interesting jobs. I was in the support function and I, I always thought that I could be good at it and that I would like it, but I never really got the opportunity to like really trade or to, you know, to, to, to work in any real genera- uh, revenue generating uh, job. Um, that, that's part of what the poker was about was to try to help me transfer and, and, and develop as I was, as I was getting older. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, it's, I, I, my, my brother works in this field. My, my father was a banker for his entire professional life. I, I, again, I thought that this is what I would do with my life. Um, or at least this is what I, the career I would start with. Um, but then poker just took over at such a young age that I just, that was, that was it, you know, a couple Mm. of years and then, and then that was it. Yeah. I understand. (laughs) I was working in a place where I had to commute to, I had to be there early and it took me over an hour to get there. So I was just, I was waking up at like five 30 in the morning, which is not like so ridiculous but it was just the the freedom of the poker lifestyle was just so attractive at the time um and like i said yeah like we talked about i mean it was just a special special time in poker uh with a lot of opportunities that were were really rare i i remember you were really you found your your forte or or your specialization in the the heads up sitting goes if i remember correctly and how, how early was it that you understood and decided that this is it. This is absolute. There's. This is what I'm going to focus on. There's no chance I'm going to, for now, focus on any, any other job. Yeah, you know, it it kind of happened coincidentally in a way. I mean, I was playing. I started playing cash games. I was always just playing cash games. It was just like the thing I was doing. Um, and I think I what happened was I had moved. I I, I was working at the same time, so I don't. And I was living at home, so I had like no expenses and I had extra income, and so it, that that gave me a lot of freedom and it, a lot much and very little stress. And it was I stopped working and then I moved out, and so those things flipped, and I started to experience a lot more stress and pressure, and I had a big downswing and I was losing some confidence, and so I think that motivated me or inspired me to try something different. And I played some tournaments. And I had some success playing tournaments, but the problem with tournaments was, is just, I mean, it was even more then, but I mean, still it's the same dynamic, which is that you have to basically say your computer, you know what I mean? If you play a tournament, you're probably going to play all the other tournaments that are in the same time frame. So even if you lose or bust in one of, you know, a few tournaments, you're still just locked into your computer. Um, and even though I played a lot of poker back then, I wanted the freedom to be able to just stop playing, you know, take a half hour break or take a two hour break and come back. Um, and so I started, I would play heads up, sit and goes kind of for fun, kind of when I was tilting. Um, and I think I've always been very comfortable and really liked one-on-one competition. Um, I play tennis, for example, now, and I play some doubles and I like it, but it's just nothing compared to singles for me. Like I, like even my fiance is even shocked at just how like, I'll go play doubles and she'll be like, oh, did you win? And I'll be like, ah, like who cares? Yeah. But with singles, I mean, I'm a maniac, you know, I mean, I'm just I'm so competitive. So it's, I just really like that type of competitive uh, dynamic and, and heads up, sit and goes, it was also a kind of, it was, it, it was a pretty niche format within the poker world. And not that many people were playing them as their main game, playing them really seriously. Um, they would play them kind of like I was like, you know, on the side for fun. Yeah. Um, and so when I started doing that, I was one of the kind of first people to be doing that. And I was able to become one of the better players. And I think in poker, there's this interesting dynamic where if you can be one of the better or best players in a niche, that's just like, that's a very, very profitable and very just good dynamic to be in. So like being like a good player in a big player pool is much less, I think, rewarding and fun and profitable than being the best player in a smaller player pool. Mm. Um, so I, I, I didn't do that deliberately. It wasn't like my no, strategy. No. I just kind of fell into that. And then, um, and then, yeah, I just loved it. And um, yeah, it just kind of fit my personality. And I, and yeah. I, 
and um, I, yeah, and I, there's always different times to to win a uh, win or lose a, a heads up sit and go, but you you usually know that this is going to be no more than forty five minutes. Or this is oh yeah, and I was playing turbos with turbos. So, I mean, yeah, the so turbos be... were like twenty minutes, uh, 15, 20 minutes <clears throat> at most. Um, How many? And I would play a lot of them. Did you play many at the same time? I actually didn't. I, I would play a few, um, but multi tabling was just never no. one of my strengths. Even now, I mean, I play more tables now playing cash, um, but it's just clearly not my strength. No. Um, I um, I've gotten better at it, but there are people who are just. I, I think there are some people who are a bit, maybe a bit more systematic. Maybe they think yeah. faster. I'm not sure, but um, it's just never been the way that I play. I does it take away a bit of the charm of playing? Charm is that the right word? That the, the fun in playing poker because you're more of a robot and 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 less of a a field player where you put in your skills and and thoughts a bit extra. I think it depends on your personality and your playing style. I, maybe you and I would have a more similar playing style because that, that's how I feel. But I, I don't think everyone has that same experience. No. I, I think there are some people who having a systematic approach um, is just natural for them. It's normal for them that that's yeah. what they like. You know what I mean? Um, the kind of some rigid rules. Or maybe it's not so rigid, but they're just, you know, they're able to think this way, think mm. fast, and they're able to just multiply their strategy among multiple tables. And if I could do it, honestly, I would, yeah. if I could be good at it. So, but I, I agree with you that my approach is much more, you know, field player is a, feel is a weird term in poker yeah. these days, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's it's kind of a term that's looked down upon. And, and I get that, honestly. Um, but and and now the more technical term is like exploitative, right? <laughs> and that is my approach, frankly. You know, I, I play in a in a player pool where there are a number of amateurs, and even the pros, I think, are are not as theoretically um, strong as in some other player pools. I mean, they're they're, they're good players, but uh, you know, I, I'm not playing Zoom on stars or you know, no. fifty hundred on you know on on GG or something. No. Um, so I. Um, I, I think being exploitative and and focusing on the mistakes and the balances of your opponents um, can reap, you know, some some good rewards. And that's always just been my approach. So yeah, yeah that is my that is the way I play. Yeah. And I think I probably have some some decent leaks in my own game, and I need to make up for them somehow. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. Uh, do you think and when poker is gonna expand in a good way and proper way, where also the state understands that they can make money from the poker for them? Yeah, I think you know. I think there's a bunch of factors. Uh, I think one is that there was a there was like a kind of hard stop on interstate play. Um, you know, in in combining the states, I think the Department of Justice reinterpreted uh, the the Wire Act in some way that that basically halted all that, and then that that went away, and that opened the door now for I think Michigan and then Pennsylvania to eventually join the pool. And I think once that happens, I think it should create some positive momentum. Um, cause if you take a state, like just for example, like Connecticut, right, I'm just making this up, but like Connecticut is a state that basically cannot operate on its own. It's just too small. But if, when it, you know, if, if it's considering this type of legislation and it knows that if, and when it passes, it can just join an already existing market, then it makes much more sense. Right. Then all of a sudden it goes from a non-starter to like a legit possibility. And I think that is an important thing because there's 50 states and some of them aren't as big as others. Now, the big states like New York and Texas and California, that's a different thing. And I think they have their own very, very specific po political dynamics that I'm not super familiar with. I mean, I have some familiarity with, but not not enough to like really um, speak intelligently on it. And I, I think, is there a possibility for some of those states to pass? Sure. I think New York comes somewhat close every year. <laughs> and then... Um, and, and I think also another important dynamic, as far as I understand it, is that poker on its own doesn't generate that much revenue, but oftentimes it's paired with just general gambling and, 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 and in particular sports betting has become super, super popular, obviously. So I think it's more likely that poker will be kind of an addendum to a larger package um, right. and that you know, again, they're, they're like you're saying, there's, there's different states with different legislatures and value systems and, and, and different, and different voices dominating. So I don't, I don't know, um, how it will, um, go down, but I, I think, you know, the, there's, it's going to go in a step-by-step -step process. So I think Michigan will join soon. Pennsylvania probably will join next year. And then all of a sudden there's going to be a little kind of core market. I mean, obviously there's Nevada with WSOP already, but, but, Nevada is kind of its own thing because of Las mm -hmm. Vegas and, and stuff like that. And I think WSOP is the only um, 
uh, online operator that, 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 that will operate in Nevada for a while is my, my sense. Yeah. So Pokestars, I mean, sorry. So New Jersey, Michigan, and PA, you know, if, and when those, that's like one cohesive market, I think, I think that, that could start to move the needle a little bit. That's the hope and that's the yeah. idea. Um, but even if it doesn't for a little while, that's still, that almost triples my market size. You right, know what I mean? Right. That, that makes a big difference already. And uh, those are three pretty, pretty, pretty decent sized states. And especially, I mean, from all kind of levels, I mean, professional players that play for a living, but also for someone who to come in to be able to take part in bigger guarantees, which will oh, be possible. 100%. I mean, if you have a a thousand dollar guarantee, it's not that tempting, you know, in Connecticut. But if if, if it's a part of a fifty thousand dollar guarantee, then it's then we're talking. Right, right, and all of these things um, build on one another, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, yeah, I, I think the future is bright. I, you know, oh, that's details great. are unclear, I mean, but because it's been so many years, it was in 2011 Black Friday. It's been so many years where people just say, "Heck, I don't know." We we almost stopped hoping, you know. We almost sure. stopped believing that we will come back. And I, I mean, all the way, all the qualifiers, all the people that came to Europe for the first time, for example, or or the Europeans that came to the States through qualifiers online. Those were pretty cool days. Sure. Uh, I remember. Sure. And I do think, you know, I think it's, you know, I, I always try to temper any, any like huge amount of optimism I have because I do think sometimes people say, oh, it's it's going to go back to the way it was in 2005. That It's, it's never going to go back to no. that. Um, and in part because, you know, people are too good. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do think that in addition to game integrity, I think um, I, I think it's important to also recognize that professionals have gotten much much better, mm. and to try to orient the online dynamics in a way that doesn't exacerbate that difference that divide. You know, so like HUDs are an example. Like I think HUDs are, you know, obviously they're if they're allowed that they're they're allowed, but uh, it's not clear to me that they that that is in the best interest of a long term sustainable ecosystem. Um, now that would make it worse for me, but um, I think that's the point, honestly. I mean, it's, it's a sensitive topic because I remember I had a regular talk with Patrick Antonius throughout a few years when I worked for Poker Magazine and Poker Tube, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember he was so much against it, and finally almost felt like it, it's impossible to beat someone who has it if you don't have it yourself, and a HUD. Well, I don't do think you, that's true. Do, do I, mean, you, I mean, it depends. I mean, if you're talking about two people with the same, you know, poker level, yeah. then sure, the person with the HUD has an advantage. Yeah. Um, but I, I also think there are professionals who are misusing the HUD. Uh -huh. um, and I think it gives you a very, it gives you a kind of a static picture. I mean, obviously, people who are very good can glean a lot of information from it. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. and, and you can do a lot of analysis. There's no doubt. But if you're just like a better poker player... I, there's, you know, you know, you can give my opponent all the tools in the world, hmm. um, but if they just, they, you know, the, the, unless, unless unless it's a cheating tool, unless it's a tool that's telling them what to do in the, in the moment, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I can, I'll still be confident against a lot of players. So obviously, not not everyone. Um, and I don't actually have the HUD up when I play. Um, I find it distracting, and I'm not good at it. <laughs> I'm not good at using yeah. the, the information. I do look at it later, um, and I try to figure some stuff out about what my opponents are doing. Yeah. But only, you know, with large samples, right? I mean, I'm yeah. only, you know, so, and, and, and again, it's always just to, to find imbalances in the way people play. Like I have a, a sense of a theoretical baseline and then it's like, okay, well, my opponent's not three betting enough from this position. Um, when he three bets me, I should probably be a bit more careful, maybe tighten up my, my range against it. You know, that, that, yeah. that kind of thing. I'm always, you know, one of the things I think people don't, like they don't, art, have, haven't heard it articulated that much, um, and what makes poker so, so special, so unique as a game is that margin of victory is the key to the game, right? So many competitive dynamics, it's binary. You win or you lose, Yeah. right? And like in tennis, for example, you know, you win three tiebreakers or you win 6-0, 6-0, 6-0, -oh, -oh, right? It's just, there's no difference. You just win. Yeah. Um, and maybe there's a little, I mean, there's some rating systems in which it matters a little bit. But my point is that in poker, like if you barely beat someone, you barely make any money. And if you crush someone's strategy... Right, then you win a lot more money, and I, that 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 is the that that I think is the real incentive, right? So like chess is always an example I'm interested in. I love chess, and it's not the same game, but it's there's some similarities. And in chess, is the same thing. Like, could you imagine 
if there was a different point system in chess where right now it's you get one point for a win, half for a draw, and zero for a loss. Yeah. But imagine if you got two points if you won in under 30 moves. Right. Right? Something like that. Like that would really change mm. the way people play. Like if yeah. you could really dominate someone in that way. Yeah. That would be, you know, that would, there are just different ways to, um, the games are, are structured differently and they reward different different skills. Yeah, that's interesting. Let's say you win a really tight game in, in, in chess and you get 0.7 and the other guy get 0.3. The, 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 right, something like right. that. Right, yeah, yeah. right. I mean, the, the, the closeness of the game is not important. It's just you either right. win or you lose or you yeah, draw. Yeah, yeah, that's right. interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Uh, okay, so... so um, uh, when we talk about because live poker has been more or less out of the question for quite a few years for you, especially since the pandemic, have you played live poker at all? <laughs> no, I haven't actually. I haven't played live poker since February of 2020. Um, wow. Wow, that's, that's a long time. Wow, I actually, I don't think I fully realized how long that was. That is a long time not to play live poker. Wow. Um, yeah, and it was actually very. Very weird situation. I was I, the last tournament I played. I played at the Borgata in Atlantic City, and I got and this was in like very end of January, I think, and I got very very sick. Um, and, and you I, got I, sick I, from being there. Yeah, I was sick there. I was very sick. I'm pretty sure it wasn't COVID. I, I think it was just the flu or something. But I, I was in the tournament. It was like day three or something, and I was in the tournament, and I was and I I, I actually got up, I felt so bad that I got up like in the middle of the level, and I started walking out of the room. And as soon as I got out of the room, I fell on the top. Like I didn't faint, but I like I fell to the ground. And a security person came up to me and was like, "Hey, buddy, you can't lay on the ground." Like immediately. Like he didn't give me one second. And I was like, "Sir, I really, I just don't feel well. I'm really sorry. Can, I, I just don't feel well." And he was like, "He was like, okay, but you can't stay here. He's like, you, we can. He's like, we can like escort you to the medical center or whatever. I didn't know inside the Borgata is like a wow. and it, like a medical clinic. Yeah. And it's like it's like in the. You know, it's like in in the interior of the yeah, yeah. and so I went in there and uh, and I had a fever, and they, she gave me some medicine and whatever. I was okay, but when I came back, I I wore a mask, and I had never ever seen anyone wear a mask in a poker tournament before. That's and I, I, and I was crazy. The, yeah, and I was the only one in the entire Borgata like wearing a mask. Like you know, the, now it's the it was a mask that you know you you have seen before, right? You'd see nurses or doctors wear it or whatever. Some people wow. randomly wear it, but the mask that we've all become so familiar with. What a pioneer! I was I was wearing a mask. Oh, ho hold on, honey, honey, I'm doing. Oh, honey, I'm doing an interview, honey. Honey, you need to leave and close the door. I don't have a quarter for you, honey. Money, please give me one. Honey, honey, I'm, I, I don't have a quarter right now. No, I don't. You need cents. Can you look into the jar that's downstairs in the kitchen? Corinne! Mommy, mommy. Corinne, I'm doing an interview right now, honey. <laughs> mommy, look, but she couldn't find it. I'm sorry, honey. I don't have a quarter here. Maybe you can look in my car. Look in the car. Sorry. <laughs> Who was that? That is my. Stepdaughter, soon to be stepdaughter. That is the the daughter of my fiance. Yeah, you were anyway, talking about yeah. th this. Is yeah, so, so funny because uh, in January 2000, uh, 2020, no one had masks. You know, no one had ever had a mask. So you were like the pioneer of mask using at the poker. Yeah, table. and then and I remember I was sitting at the table and people were looking at me all weird. And finally, somebody goes, "Dude, why are you wearing that?" And I was like, I, "I'm just not feeling well. Like I'm feeling kind of sick." And the, almost the whole table was like. Oh man, that's really nice of you to wear that mask for us. You know what I mean? They were all like so shocked, and I was like, "Well, yeah, I don't want to get people sick, you know." And then it was just like to think back on that now, you know. I actually, I don't think I've ever told that story. Um, but to think back on it now is this is very funny because yeah, you know, obviously, cool. everything that's happened. But wow, um, yeah. And then COVID happened, and then you know, I didn't play like most people did. And then you know, poker, life poker is back, right? I mean, I could have easily played over the last you know year and a half or something. Um, but I just. I just never really need, I hadn't, you know, I, I have a very kind of, I, I do play some live cash, but when I play live, mostly I play tournaments and online, I only play cash. Like, I mean, now with my poker stars, you know, I'm going to play some online tournaments, but, um, so I just felt like, you know, I would have to study a little bit and get back into it. And I didn't know if there was any specific stops that I wanted to go to. And then I was going to go to the world series, but I had a, a, my cousin was getting married in France, so I went to that during the main event, so I didn't go to the World Series at all. Just all these random things. And then I met this woman, and then we 
bought a house and moved. And now for me to play live is just very different. You know, when I was single, living on my own, going to play a live tournament, you know, sure. And now leaving them is just a much bigger cost for me. Like I really like being home with them. So like leaving them is just, yeah, I just, it's just a bigger threshold for me to, to meet, um, to play live. But at the same time, I do miss it, right? I do miss it. Um, I miss specific people. I miss seeing people and I just miss the, you know, live is just, it's, it's, fun. It, it's a competition, you know, you're, you're, you're a competitive guy. It's, it's the competition you go to, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, like, I, I compete every day because I, I play online every day. I play yeah. a lot. But it, just live, you know, also, that's the thing. Because I'm combining live with tournaments, like, being deep in a live tournament is a special kind of feeling. Like, it's it's super fun. It's really fun. And you don't, I don't get that playing, grinding online. Um, so it's a special kind of thrill to do it. And to do it live, I think, is even more interesting and exciting. So I, I'm excited to do that again. But I don't love to travel, and I don't love the variants. I'll tell you that. Yeah, but I, it was interesting. I checked your your uh, resume. Uh, I, I remember the first big score for you. The really big score was in Borgata, actually, when yeah, you won the WPT there. Two thousand nine, it was, and it was the first tournament with more than thousand people. When it comes to World WPT, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, and it's it's funny because they like if you look at the first and second place payout of that tournament, and then you compare it to the next year. The next year, I think they had just a few more people, and all of the payouts are basically like like the first place money is like 150k less, and they just take that the extra money and just distribute it among everyone else. Right. So I was just so lucky yeah. to win that tournament. Perfect it was like timing. the balloon for it was just like, yeah, I was like down 19 to one against this kid. I was like so sure I was going to get second, and then somehow I just miraculously get lucky and, and get get first. And yeah, it was that was that was a, one of the main highlights of my. Of my poker career, of course, for sure. it was a oh, real yeah. big one. I, I, I'm pretty sure it changed your 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 lifestyle more or less. But winning that kind of that that kind of money, uh, let's see, you won. Uh, yeah, it was like nine twenty five. I think. Yeah, yeah, nine twenty five. Yeah, and uh, for a three thousand five hundred dollar buy in tournament, yeah, that was a good one. Bit. That was a good one. Wow. Yeah, you yeah, that was a, a good third one. Of the price pool, more or less. <laughs> it's absurd. It's really absurd. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the main thing that it did was get me to play more live tournaments. Yeah. You know, that was the main thing it did. And I was with, I, you know, I, I was, I'm divorced now. I was married before, and and my my ex wife really liked to go to Europe. Uh-huh. Um, you know, big surprise. Yeah. So so, uh, so I started playing a lot of EPTs. Yeah. And so that. it it changed my life a little bit in that sense. I started to play more EPTs. I played. Prague a bunch of years in a row, Berlin a bunch of years in a row, London a few years, and Monte Carlo every you know a bunch of years in a row. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we did we did those trips well. I mean, we 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 lived very well during those trips. It was it was a fun time. Um, and I had some you know I had some decent scores um in in on the EPT tour. Um, and you know, PokerStars runs good events. I mean, I like PokerStars yeah. events. Um, I've been I was going to PC. I went to PCA every year for like I don't know, fifteen years in a row. Yeah, yeah, I know. What What do you think? I mean, there's one thing being a good heads up player where you made your bread and butter or whatever they say. Sure. Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> what do you think was? Um, I remember the 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 player pool was much lighter and and bigger back then. Mm-hmm. What What yeah. was it? Do you think was because you were really, really good there for a while? You had some quite good results. What was it that made you? Because you always looked so confident when you played those tournaments. Do you think that was one of the 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 the, the main parts think, of your success? I, I think it was a combination of things. I think one was just uh, a you know whatever this word that people use uh, stick to itiveness, persistence, grit. This this quality, I think. I have that um, in, in in competitive environments. I'm you know I'm very competitive and I'm very driven to to win and to to to, to do well in that environment. Um, so that's one. Um, I, I think heads up singles in particular are very interesting because they combine two things. One, you play against a lot of different players. So um, and and you can't or like you, th- there is no avoiding someone. Right. You, every hand gets the same player when you play heads up, obviously. And unlike, a, you know, and, and if you play heads up cash, for example, you can say, OK, I don't want to play this person. And obviously heads up Satan goes, you could just play one match and then not play. But in general, the real way to make money playing heads up Satan goes was to have the lobbies. That was the that was the way to dominate the game. To have the lobbies. Um, yeah. So the way it works is there would be a lobby 
which is the way the game would start, and the lobby would have two entrants, right? And so I would sit first in the lobby. I mean, if obviously there was someone there, I'd play with them. But I sit first in the lobby, and then I wait for someone to play me, right? And so let's say there's a reg or a pro sitting in the lobby. Well, then I play them, right? And then we play, and then what happens to the next lobby that opens? Well, if he sits again, you know, I'll play him again, right? And eventually, there's gonna, you know, one. If I'm better than him, or if I'm willing to play him, and he's not willing to play me, no, well, that lobby's mine. Yeah, it's like right a now, basketball I, yeah. court. The, yeah, yeah, it's court like a king of the hill type of right. right. Yeah. Right. So now that lobby becomes mine, and now now some other pro can come play me. But if I gain enough of a reputation, if I'm good enough that the pros don't really want to play me, now that lobby is mine, and I get the amateurs. Right, and I get kind of full uh, access to the I never heard that before. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah, so that's how I was able to really dominate and make a lot of money was by having the kind of attitude that, like, I'm going to attack all of these pros. I'm going to go after uh, them. I, it's, I, this is going to become my lobby. And, and there's going to be other people maybe. When I leave, people will join. Or some people, if they want to battle, they can battle. But I will battle. I will battle till the end of time. Right, that was the attitude that I had. I didn't. I, again, I wasn't thinking of this strategically. This is just my personality. This is the way I was. Um, and and so I had to figure out how to beat a lot of different playing styles. Um, and then obviously amateurs too, right? You play all different types of amateurs. Yeah. And and, and I, I think I one thing I have always been good at. I'm not good at everything in poker. But one thing I've always been good at is to very quickly identify the way someone plays. Mm -hmm. And against a pro, you know, it's hard. You know, people try to play well. They try to play balance, right? Is what they, is what everyone says. But against amateurs, it's not the same. Amateurs have a lot of tendencies, and it's a lot of things correlate. They're the, the type of player that does this is the type of player that does that, and you can start to categorize people. It's like, oh, I've played this type of player before. It's a lot of pattern recognition, um, or like I've seen this bet before, and I know it folds to an all-in, right? Or so, you know that yeah, kind of yeah. thing. So it's, it doesn't have to be theoretically sound at all. It's mm. just pattern recognition. A lot of it, what it is what it is. Yeah. So I think I, I think that is what. And, and then the, the last thing I was going to say is that when you play heads up Singo, it's a form of a tournament, which means the blinds go up. And so if you play cash, right, and you, and you, you know, I'm sure this is less true now, obviously, but it used to be more true. So the cash game players in tournaments would be good in the beginning and then much less good as the tournament went on because they would be playing, they would go from playing 200 big blinds to 100 with an ante and then 80 and then 60 and then, you know, the average would be 40 or something. Right. And so I, I would be I had experience playing five, eight, 12, 18, 30, 50 big blinds. Right? I had all the different big blinds and the ranges are different, but you just get a sense for what it means. Right. Your your understanding of what hand values mean in different stack depths is very important. And I'm doing this every game day in and day out. So I think that was good for me in the tournament oh, context. I see. Yeah. Yeah, and you can't also, when you play heads up, you can't play tight. You can't just play, you know, there are some people who their approach to poker is to just kind of play solid. They're just like, they play tight ranges, they play pretty straightforward, you know, solid um, post-flop, and it works for them because there are enough people who are overvaluing hands or not paying enough attention to the way people play that 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 style and that approach, that strategy just, you know, mostly works. And especially back then, right? Especially right, back right, then. right. Right. So, but you can't do that in heads up saying goes. I mean, or heads up. I mean, you can a little bit, but you're just, that's not the way to really win. I mean, you got to attack people, right? You got to go after people and bluff and, and be aggressive. And that was always my personality. So it fit. Hmm. I, I actually think sometimes I was too aggressive for cash games and I was a bit spewy, frankly. Yeah. Um, and that's also a, a strategy that's rewarded in tournaments, um, you know, in part because there's antis. And so, you know, more aggressive plays is, is, is rewarded. Um, and, and also the payouts are at the end, right? Right. So the, the payout structure of a tournament also rewards getting all of the chips or getting a lot of chips. Then you can bully people and all that stuff. So, you know, I, I never thought that I was that good at tournaments, frankly. Um, but I thought that I had some characteristics from heads up goes that kind of transferred reasonably well. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting because you really have an upper hand on a player that had 10 caches. And all of them has been outside the top 20. And and you had maybe two caches, but both of them were top five. Interesting, yeah. I mean, you have a big upper hand against that guy because that guy will very rarely come to the final table in a thousand player pool uh, because he plays, like you mentioned it, a bit, you know, solid and, and, and nice. But, but I guess you, if you watch the patterns of the results, I guess you can find something like that in your your uh, resume compared to a guy like that yeah i mean i gotta be honest with you there was a time in my career where i started to uh, you know find i made bad financial decisions and i started to play tighter 
in certain aspects of tournaments and I suffered for it a little bit. I think I started to play. Yeah. Just tighter. I just mm-hmm. didn't want to bust. Yeah. I wanted to cash. I wanted to get the money. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to have financial freedom to feel comfortable. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think a lot of people who play poker, um, play too big or they don't manage their money well and they get into spots where they have too much of their, you know, they, they have too much money on the line to play well. Yeah. And I think that's a huge, huge mistake. Uh, I don't think people understand how much it impacts them. Mm. Um, or at least I didn't, I under- underestimated it a little bit. Um, so I think it's really important to have that sorted and to feel comfortable because you have to be able to make plays that you think are good. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. That yeah especially. Right. Especially in tournaments. Yeah. I, I mentioned it before. Yeah, there was a, a special kind of friendship I remember between you and and, and Dan Coleman, Dan yeah. Daniel Dan. Yeah, Dan, Dan Coleman. Coleman. Yeah, yeah, Dan. yeah, Dan Coleman. Yeah, yeah. Are you still friends? Yes. Yeah, we are still friends. I don't speak to him as much as I would like. Um, I miss you, Dan. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, Dan Dan will always be one of my my good good friends. Um, you know, he's considerably younger than me, and when I met him, he was a teenager. You know, yeah. he was. 16 or 17, yeah. I think he How I think did he your work- uh, relationship, as fr- fr- friendly relationship, uh, start? I mean, it started in a very funny way. Uh, he would watch me play heads up, sit and goes. And he would, uh, you know, this was, you know, on full tilt poker where, you know, like on Poker Stars, for example, you would need to have the buy-in of the game to chat. Right. But on full tilt, you know, part of the marketing was Everyone. come play and yeah. chat with the pros. Right. So right. anybody could chat. And so he would come in and start chatting and he would say funny things, trolly things, silly things, and then sometimes strategic things. And some of the strategic things, I was like, hmm, like what's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is, that's interesting. Uh, and then, I don't know, I think part, part of the, 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 what happened was that I was, you know, I'm playing a lot online, like probably way too much at the time. And I felt I was probably a little bit lonely and I, was wanted to engage. I wanted some engagement with someone or with people in general. So I would engage with the chat more than most of the other people I was playing with, you know, and eventually that engagement just turned into, um, a Skype like yeah. a conversation, you know, just started messaging and I didn't know who he was and we started to, you know, get to know each other a little bit and, you know, he was young. So I wasn't going to like, I didn't think, you know, too much of it, but I did think he was very talented. Um, and, at some point, not too long into our chatting and, and, and talking, I offered to do some coaching and to do some staking. Um, I think I also felt like he was, um, you know, I, I think there are people who are very smart and very talented and that traditional, the traditional American school system is not really for them. Right. Um, and so that, you know, I didn't know him that well, but that was a sense I got for him. And he was working, he had a job. He was working like, I think in, uh, I think he was doing cleaning dishes, um, doing something like that in the kitchen. Um, and I was just like, this is a smart kid, man. You know, this is not, I mean, I, he was 16. So, I mean, everyone has random jobs when they're 16, but still I was just like, yeah, I think this kid can make money playing poker. Like I think, you know, given, given how much he's, you know, how little kind of training learning he's done and how much he seems to get. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. just seemed talented to me. So I was just like, well, let's give this a shot. And I think he quit that day and uh, started playing. And he was a little bit like me, too. Like, he was a maniac. He would play all the time. He was super competitive, super driven, wanted to win all the time. Um, and that created some tension between us, but also because he started playing the games that I was playing eventually. Right. Um, but, you know, we worked through that and we have just been friends for a long time. And obviously, you know, he... You know, the, something also happened that very much, that really changed a lot for me, which was the introduction of hyper heads up, sit and goes. All right, so I was playing turbos, and then hypers were introduced, and I wasn't as good as hypers, and then the the, the edges in hypers were were so small that pros couldn't battle each other in the same way. Right. And so what ended up happening was cartels were formed, which are groups of pros that all agree to play collaboratively in a way. Basically, they they agree to not let other pros play. So if I'm, you know, if you're in a cartel with your friends and I'm not in that and I'm a pro and I play, then you and all those people just take turns playing me. So the only action I can get is from you guys who are pros. And even if I'm a little bit better than you, and I wasn't really better than the pros at the time because the the strategy was a little bit different and these guys were studying and getting better. So I was probably break even. 
And in, in normal times, I, would, I wouldn't care. They'll break even, let's just go. I'll keep playing, I'll figure it out, I'll do yeah. it, right? But here, there was not that much to figure out, and they were doing well, and I just, like I said, I couldn't multi-table that well. So I just, all the action I got were from pros. And then they would, there were so many of them that, you know, there were enough of them that some of them would play me, and then some of them would just take the lobby and, and, and get the amateurs. Mm. And so the, the turbos, I still played turbos, but that action dried up a little bit. And a lot of the action was in hypers. And then Dan got into a cartel and he became the best hyper player and and just was crushing. Um, yeah. And then he leveraged that into like one of the best, you know, live tournament years anyone's ever had. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, basically almost quit poker after that. So it was like a very, it was like a, I don't know what it's called, but when something like gets really hot and then like explodes really fast, you know, yeah. <laughs> it was like one of those flare ups. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, it was like a, maybe a two, maybe, you know, 20, 24 to 30 month period where you just destroying everything. Yeah. And then, that was, that was crazy. It was it's unnatural in a way. It was like almost un, unfathomable how that was possible. And he was just brimming with confidence about it. And he was kind yeah. of a special guy. I think we met, was it Bahamas? I think it was in Bahamas. We had a talk, we had a dinner, you and I and, and Dan. Yeah. And, and, I think and, the Bahamas is right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we talked about, you know, he was kind of a shy guy. Anyway, it's not about him this, but it was interesting because it was a special kind of relationship between the two of you. And he wasn't attached to more or less anyone else, right? Well, yeah, I mean, he definitely made a bunch of friends over time. But yeah. I think, yeah, him and I had a, you know, we had a kind of big brother, little brother, mentor, yeah. mentee relationship. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I personally really enjoy those types of relationships. I wish I had more of them in, in poker. Poker is hard because it's so much direct competitiveness like yeah. I, I was i literally just talking to someone today uh about you know i i like i would love to be able to coach some of the people who play in new jersey but i, I you know they, they're gonna be playing in the games against me every day <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's hard you know it's hard i mean i could coach some other people but still it's just um i enjoy those relationships and uh, and he's a good guy and obviously a very talented player um so yeah i mean that was that was that was an interesting, and I think you're right. There was a combination of like, he got really lucky. He had a lot of confidence. Other people played poorly against him. Everything just came together perfectly yeah. to form this amazing year. Yeah, we yeah. talked about Victor Bloom a while ago, Isildur, when he came through. And it was, I, I wouldn't compare it, but in a way, there there are a few of those guys that comes through and the mix of destroying the opponent's confidence. And yeah. I mean, you can't say luck because it's it's a special kind of skill when they go through and just crush everything. And it's just, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. And I actually think Dan and Isildur uh, became pretty close. Yeah. Um, I think they, they recognized something similar in the other. Yeah. Um, but I just think, yeah, Dan was just able to keep things together in a way yeah. that Victor was much more, more difficult for Victor, I think. I, yeah. I don't know enough about him. I don't want to talk no, about no, the situation. No, but, but they are kind of related, their stories or their phenomenon. Maybe. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, I remember it was something really strange out of all this poker playing and the big community and the, all the travel and everything. And suddenly you came out with this uh, MMA challenge for the poker community. What was that all about, Olivier? It, yeah, it, I mean... Late it, 2015. Yeah, so um, that was an interesting and fun story. It wasn't as fun as it was happening. Uh, but so I, like I said, I was married and I, I, I got divorced and after my divorce, I was in a kind of a strange place. I was trying to figure out what direction I would go in, what kind of person I would be. Um, and so I think because of that, I was open to new experiences in a way that I might not otherwise have been. And I was training, uh, just normal, like kind of bodybuilding, weightlifting training with a trainer, uh, at a gym. And he was this huge Russian guy, like really intimidating, kind of scary looking guy, but a sweetheart actually. Um, and one day he said, he told me that he could teach me how to fight if I wanted, that he had had a MMA career. He had had like 17 fights or something. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then I just, I, it was a little bit like this sponsorship thing where I just said something with no intention behind it at all, just kind of throwing it out there. And I said, I said, you know, I bet, I bet I could get a poker player to bet to, to fight me for a bet, you know, because, and the reason I said that was because I always had considered myself to be a, a pretty good athlete. And I think that that was never a part of my, of the perception of me in the poker world. You know, right. at the time I was, I was, I was skinnier and I had long hair and I had a French name and I just 
to sports were just never really a part of my poker experience, like very much. I played some basketball with some people, but that was a small group. Um, and so I thought I, my athleticism would be undervalued in the poker market, basically. Um, and so again, I, I, this, again, I, I didn't think this was going to happen. I just kind of put it out there, but I put it out on Twitter and said, Hey, is anybody looking to, to try to, you know, I'm looking for motivation basically is what I said, I'm looking for motivation to train in MMA. And again, I, I had always had this desire to learn how to fight. I growing up watching Jean-Claude Van Damme movies, that kind of stuff. I was, was one of those young boys that always wanted that. Um, that skill set, but had never learned jujitsu. I'd never even, didn't really know what it was. And I, what was interesting to me looking back is that I wasn't even a fan of the sport at all. Hmm. I didn't know who Conor McGregor was when I made that bet. Right. And actually, with, this is funny because it's with a, with Dan Coleman the summer before in Vegas. Dan was like, "Hey, come to a club with me. There's some big fight." Um, and I was like, okay, like, I don't care about the fight, but we went to the club and there was some big fight on the screen. I didn't really pay much attention to it, but later on I was going through like every MMA fight, like just watching all, like all day long, I would just watch fights. And then eventually I came to this fight and I was like, oh, this was the fight that I called in. I was like, this was the, he was like, that was the same fight. It was very funny. But, but yeah, so I, again, I put it out on Twitter and like when I put it out on Twitter, I, I, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't expect much, honestly. I thought maybe I would get some response from someone I had never heard of. Yeah, you know, and that 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 would be very hard to to assess. But yeah. what ended up happening was uh, almost like within ten minutes, I think, like I was still at the gym with my trainer, that Steve O'Dwyer responded, and he responded with just the words "paging J.C. Alvarado." And I knew J.C. I had played poker with him. I knew who he was. I had, like I said, I played with him a few times. But I didn't know he was a huge MMA fan. I didn't know that he had had a bet with Andrew Robel that was actually somewhat similar in structure, um, and that that had you know never you know happened. And so he had been hungry for this kind of experience. So later that night, JC messages me, and all of a sudden, I'm like discussing this possibility as if it's a real possibility. I was like, I was, I almost was just like, hey, I was just joking. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and very soon after that. As it became a real possibility, I got very, very nervous and uncomfortable, and I came very, very close to just being like, I was going to blame it on my mom. I already knew how I was going to do it. Yeah, I was going to say, hey, man, I really wanted to have this experience. I would love to do it, but my mom just won't let me. Like, it's just, it breaks her heart, the idea of it. And this was all true. It broke my mom's heart, like, the idea of it. I was actually living with her at the time because I was going through this divorce, and I would come back from training every day to my mom my mom's apartment. And it was, she was just like, I mean, she, this was not her thing at all. Uh, but anyway, I, I just, I, I decided that I didn't know what kind of person I wanted to be, but I knew that I didn't want to be the kind of person that took this way out. Right. So I just was like, I'm going to say yes, I'm going to go through with it. I'm going to do it. And, uh, we came to terms. I was very lucky that I, I found a great coach and a great uh, gym um, and that this Russian guy was not the guy who trained me, but he was the guy that did my strength and conditioning and he was am amazing at that. Uh, so I just got very, very lucky. Uh, I found this like small gym that was really dedicated to helping me uh, learn and I had basically private lessons three or four days a week with like a, a, a black belt and amazing coach and then a, a three or four people, young kids who were on the fight team who were all wanted to be coaches and were all helping me and it was amazing. And they, they, they replicate, they were like similar to JC in size, like, you know, like I wasn't training with people bigger than me. I was training people smaller than me, just more skilled. So it was just, they were great training partners. And, and yeah, so six months later, we, we bet a lot of money. Uh, it was like a six figure bet and, uh, rented a gym in Las Vegas, had three judges, a referee, we sold tickets, we streamed it online. Um, and then we fought. And it, it, the thing is also because I knew nothing about the sport, when we negotiated the terms, I, I didn't know what to do. So he was just, he would ask me, he would be like, um, you know, amateurs in, in MMA, they have to wear shin guards. They're not allowed to hit to the face on the ground, no elbows, all that stuff. He's like, what do you want to do? And I was like, no, 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 let's do full, full professional rules, like full UFC rules. He was like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah. He was like, okay. And then he was like, what about the time? You know, he was like, uh, five amateurs do a long time. three minutes, uh, but pros do five. And I'm like, oh, yeah, let's do, let's do five. Let's do pro. <laughs> 
He's like with you know, confidence. Yeah, he, with confidence. He was like, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. He he was like, dude, are you an idiot? He was started to argue with me, but he didn't want to seem like the person I think do like asking for the 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 less thing. You know what I mean? And I think he actually understood that I didn't know what I was talking about, and I didn't. Hmm. I. One, my friend who set me up with the coach is a purple belt and a big fan, and he knew a lot of stuff, and he was helping me. But I, he was very clear to JC that I didn't know what I was talking about, and I think that gave him a lot of confidence because right. he was just like Olivier is way over his head and has no idea what's going on. No. I was like I'm going to crush this guy, and it's true I didn't know what was going on, but I don't think he understood how seriously I was going to take it. So, so eventually we came to terms, and I was also able to weigh 20 pounds more than him, and I think his confidence is what allowed is what let him give me that weight difference, right? We were trying to make up for his training advantage. I had no training and he was already a blue belt and had done some training prepared for this other fight. And so he gave me 20 pounds as a weight advantage, which I think was a lot. <laughs> it was a Let's say if he would say 10 pounds, would you adjust to that and, and be 10 pounds lighter? I mean, yeah. I, I Would I have accepted that at the time? I don't actually remember. <laughs> no, no. I I, because I don't know. I, there was a difference. I, maybe in, I would have, yeah. Just over 15. 20 pounds difference, I think. 22 and a half. Two, 22 and a half, yeah. yeah. So, so let's yeah. say he could have said, okay. Let's do 15 or you, something like that or 10. Yeah, you, you, you can get 10, 10 pounds more. You can get five pounds more. I mean, that, I mean five pounds, I don't think I would have done. I, no, I, I think no. I wanted a, a real, a real yeah, difference. Yeah. I, the thing also, though, is that um, I made another big mistake, which is that I didn't realize that MMA is essentially a cardio sport. Yeah. And I had oh. just... I had just gained like 10 or 15 pounds of muscle in the preceding like three years from training very hard. And I was, I literally said this to him. I was like, I don't want to lose the weight that I've gained. Right. And so what I ended up doing for six months was eating a ton and trying to maintain my weight, even though I have a pretty thin frame and my body was trying to shed this weight. Mm. So it was a constant battle. So if, if the 10 pound difference had been my weigh in at one, which was 187.5 to his weight at 177.5, that would have probably not been great for me. No. It would have been hard for him to gain that weight, but it would not have been great for me. But if instead it was, it went the other way, like I could have cut those 12 and a half pounds. You know, I don't know. It's hard to tell what would have happened right. obviously, but I think that would have been a much, much more natural weight for me. Yeah. I would have been, my cardio would have been much better. I would have been faster. Yeah. That would have been, you know, like if I were, I thought about trying to do it again and I would have fought at, you know, 160, 165. I mean, much less, much, yeah, much yeah. less. At least 15 or 20 pounds less. Yeah, I actually so, watched the, the fight before our talk here and I, I, I went to YouTube where it's it. And, and I remember you, I mean, I, I, I known you by then for a few years. You looked like a beast there. Would you say that you look similar to how Yacy Alvarado usually, like he looked there, if, if you know what I mean? That I normally looked more like he looked then. Yeah. No, I, my body type is very different. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I was thinner. I was thinner, thinner before. Because you and were I'm a thinner beast now. In the cage. And you, I'm thinner you're... now. Yeah. I also think though that my body in particular gets an enormous amount of pump from exercise. Uh -huh. so like even like last week, like my my fiance came home and she looked at me and she's like, "Why do you look so big right now?" And I was like, "Because I literally just finished a workout." Now that just happens to everyone, but I think it happens to me a little bit more. Yeah. So like right, you know, so some pictures I posted during the thing to try to intimidate him, and and, and right as, after the fight, like again, my my muscles look bigger when through pump than they really are. I, yeah. I have small yeah. insertions. I just have like, like it's the the genetics of that. So yeah. I I think I, I actually look like most people thought. Uh, and still think that I weigh much more than I do. Right. And I think that's part of the reason why. I, I look bigger than I really than I am, um, yeah, yeah, in part yeah. because of that. But what? but yeah, I mean, I, I gained some weight and uh, and I looked big. I, I actually my body fat percentage is definitely less now than it was then, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's some fat there too, but yeah. yeah. And I and I was taking creatine, which helps yeah. uh, put on some weight. What what an amazing experience in life to do that because it was a proper cage there were the proper judges the proper referee the crowd was there yeah and it was a brutal fight it i mean was I, such I, a brutal fight yeah i mean you know unfortunately for him um uh, i i didn't really take much damage but it's yeah it was an incredible experience All, i think also for me like i was a very i was very afraid you know i i talked about being afraid like in the negotiations But I mean, I had to convince myself to go to training every day. Every single day I tried, I thought of some excuse. 
uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not feeling well, blah, 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 you know, whatever. And and it just, I think, overcoming that constantly. I mean, overcoming your fear is one of the biggest cliches in the world. But um, I, I think for me, what what ended up happening was I put myself in a position where I could not say no anymore. You know what right. I mean? Like I, right. I was locked. I was locked in. I made yeah, you this locked yourself in. This was happening in. This mm. was happening now. So it was just like I had that motivation every day to to to, to use because I, I, I would I would have quit if I could have. I know that. I really didn't like the training. Um, I liked the people mm. and I liked the strength and conditioning stuff. But I didn't like being choked every day. Um, and I just didn't like the anxiety. I would I'm I you know, I'm not as I'm not that anxious now. And I don't think I'm, I don't know how anxious I am in general. I don't really know the answer to that, but I, I get nervous before things. I get nervous before poker tournaments. I used to get nervous. I used to run track was my big thing. I used to get nervous before track meets. I, I, I get like nervous before things. Um, and I think this helped me a little bit. It gave me a little bit more confidence. And like you say, it was a very different kind of experience for me. And I think that's very important for people to kind of round out who they are as, as people is to get very different types of experiences. Um, so this, yeah, this was a, a good experience for me as a person to like develop. I mean, compared to guys who've been maybe into wrestling or into jujitsu when they were younger, they had quite a few years of building up their experience of going into a fight, which yeah, you yeah. didn't have. And I think it's just uh, the basic instinct of going into somewhere where someone is going to do their best to hurt you. That's for most people a pretty intimidating fact. And something, sure. that, and your the back of your brain is saying this is wrong. <laughs> You're not supposed to go into this willingly. Yeah, it's interesting that you say the back of your brain, right? Because it's that that's the whatever the reptilian part, right? That's yeah. like the it's the part that's not the the part that you identify as you, right? Yeah. It's almost it's like the part you you feel like at least for me, it's, you know, you feel like you don't really have control over it. And I think that that is the feeling that I had a little bit, which was that like. It didn't matter how I tried to rationalize or argue. You know what I mean? That that wasn't the part of my brain that was operating. It was this baser part. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I and I, yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, if I mean, I I I, I developed a completely different level of respect for people who wrestle or people who do jujitsu. Yeah. yeah. And and but at the same time, what was interesting to me was also that I garnered immediate respect from the people at my gym yeah. because there were a number of people there who were serious you know, jujitsu practitioners yeah. or whatever, but they had never had a fight. I, right. I, you know, having a, a proper fight was wow. completely different. And even the guys, the guys that I trained with, some of them, were, they turned pro later, but they were amateurs at the time, but they were serious amateurs training all the time, you know, but again, the amateur rules are different. So they would be like, Oh, you're, you're having this fight. What, what are, what's the format of the fight? And I was like, Oh, five minute rounds. They were like, fine. You're doing five minute rounds. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, we don't even do five minute rounds. I was like, I know I'm, a, I'm an idiot. They were <laughs> like, happened. they were like, are you allowed to elbow to the face? And I was like, yeah, they were like, really? Like that's hardcore, man. Like that's pretty serious. So in a way, you know, like I was able to gain that respect, even though again, it was like an accident. Like I didn't know what I was no. doing. I just chose the more extreme option every time, yeah. maybe ego, maybe whatever. But it was, there was an interesting dynamic where I gained this respect that I didn't, that wasn't the plan. Right. No, but, it's, it's such an interesting happening. And, and I mean, can, have you w showed it to old friends or, or people and, and, and have you watched yourself and kind of looking at that guy, that 187 pound guy <laughs> with those eyes going in there, like you don't recognize yourself, if you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah, no, no, I, that, I think that, that is the person that I am That is now. you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's more me than, than, <laughs> than the person 15 years ago, I think, M much more. I became that person more. I mean, when you say the eyes, I, I don't relate to that as much. I'm sure there's something there. Um, and, you know, the thing that might be there is probably focus and fear more than anything. Like, yeah. you know, I, I, I was pretty afraid, um, but I was, I was prepared. And I think that's what helped me deal with that, mm. was being prepared. Uh, I felt prepared. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just think it was a good experience for me. Yeah. And I, I, there were a lot of ways in which I was very lucky. Um, like again, I, I think it was, it was much more comfortable for me to be up against someone that I was bigger than. Yeah. Right. Like at the weigh in the day, the day before, I remember when he walked into the gym and I was just confident. Like I felt physically confident. Like I looked good yeah. and I was bigger than him. He like didn't want to even take his shirt off at the time. I remember this. He didn't even want to go on the scale. And we're like, this is why we're here is to go on the scale. Yeah. And he was like, fine. But like I looked just like a bigger, stronger person than him. And that yeah. itself gave me some confidence. So 
Yeah, I think I was fortunate in some ways. Yeah, um, there were quite a few factors that kind of tipped the scale in your advantage. And, and from the first hit, I remember after eight minutes in that, uh, that you had a good counter hit. And after yeah. that, it was more or less just going I was on way. top a lot. Yeah, I was on yeah. top a lot after yeah. that. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just, I had good coaching and I yeah. had good preparation and I was just ready, yeah. Um, but yeah, I do watch it sometimes and I just... I, I don't know. Some part of me is just like, oh man, I if I could do this again, I would be so much better. That's what I. That's actually what I think. It was like yeah. I, I I've had this this desire to do it again. I, I'm not gonna do it now. It's too late for me. I think. But for a couple of years, I was like, I know exactly what I would do. I would go to Thailand for like four weeks. I would go to Brazil for four weeks. I would train here. I would train there. I was like, I would be 15 or 20 pounds lighter. I, I would be. I would stretch so much more and get more flexible. I knew. I was just like so. I, I was like, finally, yeah. I know what I'm doing now after yeah. the thing happened. You know. Yeah, yeah. So I, that's one of one of the things because I feel so slow when I watch. I'm just like prodding around and I'm so tired. I remember how tired I was because there was a moment where he almost gets me. He he has this. He tr he goes for this heel hook thing. I think. Yeah. And I'm like hopping around trying to get my foot out of there, and. You know, I don't. I actually don't really know how to defend against heel hooks at all. It's not something we really trained very much, um, and so I was just like, I was just like, oh my, like in my, you know, part. The thing that was going through my mind was like, this could just be over. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it does all of a sudden it's just over, and uh, and finally when I got out and then got on top of him, I just remember like there was a sense of relief, mm -hmm. but with that relief came just exhaustion. I yeah. was just like, oh my God, I can't move. I was like, oh my God, I can barely move. But he was tired too. And you know what I mean? It was okay. Yeah. It was a big adrenaline dump for both of us, I think. But I was just like, I remember right at, I felt okay. And then after that moment, I was like, oh, I, I can't move any. Like, I'm so tired. I hope he won't move either. Yeah. And he was so tough, obviously. He, yeah. he was like, you know. Yeah. yeah. I remember because I was doing a lot of interviews back then. And you and I had a talk before that, I think over Skype. And I also contacted JC I think it was in Florida or something like that. And we had our talk outside his house before the match. So it was really oh, wow. interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so it was interesting to follow it through that way. Yeah, and I actually, I ended up, you know, I have I, I did a podcast. I did a few episodes of a podcast a couple of years ago. And I ended up doing an episode with JC. Wow. Um, and that was really, really interesting. I was really glad that he was, um, you know, willing to come on and, and chat with me. And we had a... a, a a really interesting chat about our different points of view and our different perspectives. And I, 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 I really enjoyed that. Cause I didn't really get to speak to him much afterwards. Um, but that gave me a little bit of closure to the experience too, yeah, which is yeah, fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, th that's, that's an interesting and different view for poker players. I mean, there were, I remember Lex Welthaus and, and, and Elke had a fight yeah, and yeah. so on, but this was something else. This was something else. And, 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 uh, a lot of poker players, uh, will never forget it. Anyway, uh, so yep. do you plan to come back and doing one, some of those European stops in maybe next year? So I'm going to go to the Bahamas. I'm going to play the PSPC. Mm -hmm. um, very excited about that. Wow. Uh, I love the Bahamas. I've been to this. I know it was at the Atlantis for a long time, and now it's at this other resort, the, the what is it, the Belmar or whatever it's called. Yeah. But I've been to that resort. It's a beautiful resort, and uh, I think it's a great. It's just I'm just super excited for that trip. I just love those trips. Yeah. Um, and it's an amazing tournament. I mean, it's just like that's one of the best tournaments of the year, I think. Um, so I'm very excited for that. Um, I'm sure that I will play some WSOP. Um, and I'm going to play at least one EPT, maybe two. Um, I haven't decided which one yet, um, but I'm for sure going to play at least one EPT. And again, I'm, ex I'm just excited to play live. I'm excited to play tournaments. Um, I just have, you know, I've been grinding for a while basically ever basically since that fight like the fight happened and then i, I you know i it, there was the world series like like a month or two after and then i came home and when i came home that's when i moved to new jersey literally right, right like in august of that year and i've been in new jersey since then Wait, was that 2015 is that what you said 16 16 right okay 16 so it's been six years hmm. so i've been living in new jersey for six years yeah five in edgewater and one here um and so, and honestly, during those six years, like I've just, I've grinded, like I don't play the volume I did in my twenties, but I, I play a lot and I play every day almost. And I've just been grinding and I've just like gotten my life in order. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, my financial life, my romantic life, like everything is, 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 is really good now. And so I'm excited to like, you know, play some live poker and, uh, and kind of re reconnect, um, with the poker world. Yeah, I guess it's been a grind for you, but is there also room for 
other things? Do you set a time frame? I will not play more than this, or I will play oh, as long as I feel. No, I'm super disciplined. <laughs> I'm super. I'm. That's one huge change for me. Is I, I I I play three sessions a day. I mean, there's I have a default schedule, so I play a late morning session, I play an afternoon session, and then I play an evening session. Uh, no more, no, never more than two hours. Um, and that's only the schedule I have when I'm not ha don't have anything else to do. So tomorrow, for example, I have something to do, so I'm not playing my morning session. Um, and like I I don't play sessions all the time. But that, if I don't have anything to do, that's what I do. And I almost never play more than that. So is, is, is it is it you said almost every day? Is it seven days a week? My so so the way I do it is that I have this um, default schedule, and my default schedule is seven days a week. I do not I never schedule a day off. I take days off because of circumstances, right? I go on a trip, or I just have something planned, or whatever. Uh, but if I, I never schedule a day off, and the reason is because so many things do come up. Right. You know, and my schedule, the way it's set up, it's not that much. It's like 35, it's five hours a day, seven days a week, 35 hours a week. Right. And I only end up playing like probably 25 to 30 of those. Yeah. Right. So it's not really not that much. Um, and, you know, I could obviously just take Sundays off and play more or less or I can do whatever I want. I just I don't need to take days off because I take days off, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, yeah I take yeah, days yeah. off when it makes sense for them to take, you know what I mean? Right. So. But I don't play that much. I do a lot of other stuff. I mean, I, I have a family now, um, and um, I, I play a ton of tennis. I love tennis. Um, I've been playing the violin a little bit, actually. Violin, um, really? Yeah, I played for a, I played for five years when I was a kid, um, and wow. then during COVID, I started to take lessons again. I found this incredible teacher online. Wow, um, cool. And I just think I think music is just a really interesting uh, way of rounding things out. Um, playing music and listening to music. I've always loved music. Um, and I just think it's an interesting thing because I, you know, my brain goes for certain things. Like I love chess. Like I actually, I met my fiance because I, I, I went to Philadelphia to play a chess tournament. Wow. And that's where, that's where she was living. Um, so I got really into chess. I hired a coach and was studying and doing all this stuff. And, but that's the, like ch poker and chess aren't the same, but there's a, it's the, my brain is acting a little bit in the same kind of way. Right. But when I'm, when I try to play music, it's very, very different, I think. And I think that's good for me. Um, so um, I've been doing that, and, and I just, you know, I, I, I read, and I I'm got into trivia, actually. I'm in a trivia league where I think I'm probably, like, the worst person in the entire league. But it's a very tough league. <laughs> what it's is very, that? Trivia? Very strong is it league. like a – what is that? It's just like trivia is just, like, general knowledge questions. That you just, like, get is questions. Is it like an app, answers. or is it a – Oh, the thing I do is it's a specific league that I was introduced to. Um, you have to be referred to it. Um but I just, it's very strong. It's very, very strong. I'm, I'm very bad at it. But, but is, is, is it like common knowledge? Is it precedence? Yeah, and, yeah. And like trivial yeah. pursuit, but, but in a league? Exactly, yeah. It's ah, exactly okay. what that is. Yeah, but it's, it's, the one I'm in is, like I said, is very tough. Um, so. but, it, but it inspires me. The reason I like it is because it inspires me to learn things. Right. So, so I've started to learn. Like I, I can see what some of my weaknesses are. One of my weaknesses is literature. And I'm just like, man, how, like I watch Jeopardy and I'm just like, how do these people know all this stuff about literature? Like really what seems to me very obscure stuff. So I started to learn some stuff and I'm like, oh, that, or, or like paintings, for example. Like I started to learn all these, all these paintings and I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool actually. Now yeah, I have, now I knowledge. have a slightly better sense. I mean, some yeah. of the stuff is, is useless in a way, right? Yeah. Just knowing the names of a painting and who painted it. But that for me, that's what leads me into understanding it in a more deep way. Yeah. So that's, I love that stuff. And my, my fiance is just a very, very interesting and intelligent person. She's a professor at university and, um, and she just inspires me to learn things. And we, we together, we're just, a, it's, it's a great dynamic that we have. So it's, wow. it's, I'm it's really great. happy to hear that. So yeah. you're better to feel like, do you, do you, you wouldn't play the violin here just a short bit. Do you have a no. job? <laughs> no, that would be too, too much. That would be too much to read a pull out. I, the fun, actually, to be completely honest, I probably wouldn't have done it. My violin actually broke a string. I have to get it repaired. Uh, that's been what, something that's, that's why I said I, I kind of, I haven't been doing it in a little while. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get back into it soon, but I haven't repaired it yet. So I couldn't even, even if I wanted to, but I really wouldn't want to, that would be, <laughs> so I feel say, uncomfortable enough when my, when my, my fiance is here to play. Yeah. 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 If, 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 if we do one of these, in, in a couple of years time or in some time maybe you you do something with that maybe, yeah, well, my, maybe. My, my my stepdaughter is who's five is taking piano lessons and so i told her like at some point we'll do a little duet together you know wow. like she's 
she, you know, she's just beginning, obviously, right? So I don't have to be that good to play like some duet yeah. with her. So we'll do that maybe when she like a year or two. We'll do if, that if you don't have your complete uh, fiance's heart, that will that will tie it. That'll do it. That'll, <laughs> that'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, when when I proposed to her, I proposed to both of them actually. You did. So I think I think she appreciated that. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. really nice. I yeah, so so, so uh, you know, old fashioned style is that you get engaged at the time you decide when you're going to get married. Is this a, how you did it? it or you have you no, decided not, not exactly. Marry? We we've been discussing getting married for a while, um, and I don't know exactly when we'll do it. Um, oh, okay. I, yeah, I don't know. I would say probably spring or fall of next year. So you'll probably get married next year. Oh yeah, I think next year is probably a good yeah. bet. So yeah. now you yesterday you got engaged. You you kind of promised to each other that okay, this is good enough. We, we we're gonna get married. Yeah, basically, yeah, we committed to the to getting married, and um, yeah, there was a, I got her a ring, and I, yeah, yeah, in some ways we're like quite a modern couple, and then in some ways we're actually very traditional. Um, yeah. It's a good it's a good mix, but um, but yeah, I, I I yeah, it was it was a nice kind of traditional moment. Oh, I'm um, happy for you, Olivia. That's yeah, really nice. You. I think some people get engaged like being together plus, you know, and I think the old fashioned oh, sure. way is. You get engaged when you decide that you're going to get married. Yeah, no, okay, so it was like that, yes. Yeah. We are committing to getting married. We're not going to be engaged for five years no, or no, just no. engaged indefinitely. No, no, it's no, going to no. lead to a wedding for sure. Oh. Yeah, and actually, my, I didn't have my, the first, when I got married the first time, I didn't actually have a wedding. So I've never had a wedding with, like, my friends and family oh, there and stuff. Man. So I'm actually very excited to do that um, and to just do it once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds good, Olivia. It was, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, it's interesting. There's so many topics to talk about. And you, I remember uh, we had one really long talk. I think it was in London where we sat at a poker table in a separate room that was closed off. And we had like a talk for, for almost an hour about politics and religion and all that. Mm, yeah. And, and, and that was why I got into I think some of, some of the best interviews I've done have been with you, actually. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty, I'm, I'm, I, I would say the same because that was the reason why I got into poker because I was working in sports before and, and doing interviews with poker players are, they have more things, most of them have more things that they are interested of. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So, and that's one of the advantages of playing poker for a living is that it gives you the time and the bandwidth potentially if you want to pursue other things. And that's one of the things I love the most about it. I mean, I know a lot of people who have like serious careers and interesting careers, but their careers are very dominant in their lives. Yeah. Their jobs are very, very dominant in their lives. And, and I have you know a lot of respect for that, but I, I like the fact that I'm able to to pursue different things and to do different things. And I'm you know, as much as I love poker and play a lot of poker, it doesn't completely dominate my life in the same way that some people's jobs do. Okay, thank you very much for this talk and good luck with everything. And hopefully in the future we'll meet in real life and I maybe get to hear the violin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that, but I, I would love, uh, Ricard, I would love to see you in real life and, and to catch up and, 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 and chat. So thanks, thanks for the interview. Thanks for the chat. It was great to see you. Great to chat. Yeah, good to see you too. Excellent talk with Olivia Busquet, now uh, the new sponsored player, the new ambassador for PokerStars. Congratulations, Olivia. Uh, great uh, talking to uh, Olivia for a while, and we look forward to seeing him in, uh, in the Bahamas in January, if not earlier than that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the show that was made together with uh, uh, our partner, Every Game Poker. See you next time.